Okay, in this video we're going to start section 2.3 and that is evaluating limits analytically. And in this section we're going to cover a few things here. Evaluating a limit using the properties of limits. Uh, develop and use a strategy for finding limits. Evaluate a limit using uh, the dividing out or rationalizing techniques. And evaluate a limit with the squeeze theorem. Okay, now, don't get bogged down in the details of the following six theorems. I'm about to throw six theorems at you. Each has multiple parts. Don't get distracted from the big idea. The big idea is direct substitution works sometimes. It should be when you're evaluating a limit, uh, the first thing that you try. Uh, like if I had this, what is the limit as x approaches 2 of the function x squared? Well, you know... Uh, there's no chance to divide by zero or anything, so I can just take this x value, x is approaching 2, and I can plug that 2 in for the x, so that would be 2 squared, and we all know 2 squared is 4, so that's the limit. The limit as x approaches 2 of the function x squared is equal to 4. Just try to substitute that arrow number directly into the function and see if you get an answer. If you get 0 divided by 0, then we're going to have to take uh, other steps. but uh, don't get the uh, law or don't uh, lose sight of the forest because all the trees get in the way. Six theorems are about to be thrown at you. The big idea is direct substitution sometimes works. It should be your first attempt at finding a limit. So in the last section you learned that the limit of a function f of x as x approaches some number c does not depend on the value of the function at that given point. It may happen however that the limit is precisely f of c. In such cases, uh, the limit can be evaluated by direct substitution. That is, the limit as x approaches c of f of x is f of c. We just take that c and plug it in for x. Such well-behaved functions are continuous at point c. And we'll examine uh, that concept more in the next section. So here is our first uh, theorem box, theorem 1, 1. These are just some basic limits. Oops. So if we have the limit as x approaches c of some function b, then the limit is b. And this sometimes is the harder one for the students to wrap their heads around. If I had something like this, like if it was the limit as, the limit as x approaches 2 of 4. Well, this is our function. y equals this. y equals 4. What does that look like? Well, that's just a horizontal line crossing the y-axis at 4. And this is saying no matter what x value we put in, you know, here's our value c, whatever it is, any x value that we put into the function automatically gets mapped onto this line. Everything here, every x value has a value of 4. So the limit as x approaches c of some constant is equal to just that constant. Uh, now we have the limit as x approaches c of x. And that's just going to be equal to whatever the number c is. Again, I think these are easier to see graphically. Uh, this is y equals x, y equals x, or y equals 1x plus 0, if you want to see it in slope-intercept form. So that's just a line. Oops. We have a line here going through the origin and up. Oh, and that's terrible again, but I guess I can just do this. So here's our function, y equals x. If I plug in this x value of 2, I go up and over, and I get an output value of 2. Uh, the same thing for 5. If I put 5 in for x, my y value is going to come out as 5. So the limit of x as x approaches c is just c. We plug that c in place for x, and that's our answer. And it also works if the variable is... Uh, the base of an exponential. Here the limit as x approaches c of x to the nth power. Again, x is approaching c. First attempt should be to plug c in for that and see if it works. c to the nth power. So here in example one, we're just going to evaluate some basic limits uh, with these theorems that we just uh, saw right here. So the limit as x approaches 2 of 3, that's uh, theorem 1, 1, part 1. You know, we have a constant function here, so that limit for part A, the limit as x approaches 2 of 3 is equal to 3. Uh, part B, now it's the limit as x approaches negative 4 of x. Again, we're just going to take our arrow number down here, the number that we are approaching, and plug it in for x. 
So the limit as x approaches negative 4 of x is equal to, surprise, negative 4. And for part c, this is uh, an example of our third uh, part from the theorem box. The limit as x approaches 2 of x squared. The limit as x approaches 2 of x squared. We just plug that 2 in for x, so now it's 2 squared, and that's equal to 4. There we go, the most basic types, just try direct substitution. Uh, theorem 1, 2, some properties of limits. So b and c are real numbers, let n be a positive integer, and let f and g be functions with the following limits. Now notice both limits here are approaching the same number c. The limit is x approaches c, and the limit is x approaches c. The limit of the f of x function is l, and the limit of the g of x function is k. And remember these limits are just numbers on the y-axis. So the first one here in theorem 1, 2 is a scalar multiple. We have our limit as x approaches uh, c of our f of x function, but we got a constant out front here. You know, this b is just some number. And what this property of limits allows us to do is we sort of pull that b out front, we factor it out because it's just a number, and then we take the limit of the f of x function, which is l, and then we multiply the b back through. So this limit is b times l. If we have a sum or a difference of those two different limits, here is the limit as x approaches c of, and we got this quantity, f of x plus or minus g of x. And remember, the limit of f of x is equal to l, and the limit of g of x is equal to k. So we just take those limits, l and k, and we either add or subtracting, subtract them based on whatever uh, operation we have going on here. Uh, the product one. Number three product, we have our limit as x approaches c. Now we're multiplying the two functions, f of x and g of x. Well again, f of x's limit is l, g of x's limit is k, so we just multiply them together. Uh, if those two functions, f of x and g of x, are set up in a quotient, f of x is the numerator, g of x is the denominator. You know, our limit of x, f of x is l, that's our numerator. The limit of g of x is k, so we're left with l divided by k, provided that k is not equal to zero, because we don't want to blow up the world and divide by zero. And it also works with uh, a power. The limit as x approaches c. Here's our function f of x in the brackets. And now the entire function is raised to the nth power. Well, we know the limit of the f of x function is l. So we just have l. And now it's all raised to the nth power. Again, these are just uh, more mathematical ways of saying try direct substitution work. Just take that uh, number that your x value is approaching, plug it in for x, and see what happens. Uh, example two, uh, I didn't leave anything here for you to uh, actually write out. Uh, it just shows, you know, how they break this down step by step using those properties. It's sort of, you know, the long way to get the job done. We have the limit as x approaches 2 of our function, 4x squared plus 3. Well, our one property said we could bust that up into two separate limits. We have a limit here of a sum of two separate things. We can break them up into separate limits. So our first one is the limit as x approaches 2 of the 4x squared term. And then we have plus the limit as x approaches 2 of the constant term 3. We had the constant multiple, this scalar multiple. This 4 here is just a number. So we can bring that sort of out front and put some parentheses around that limit. Now it's 4 times, you know, that quantity. The limit as x approaches 2 of x squared, and we still haven't changed this yet, plus the limit as x approaches 2 of 3. And now we're just going to take that 2 and plug it in for the x. So this becomes 4 times the limit of 2 squared, and then we have our plus 3. And that all works out to 19. And in this example, note that the limit as x approaches 2 of a polynomial function, p of x equals this, 4x squared plus 3, is simply the value of p at that x value 2. So again, we could have just, from the beginning, done direct substitution. We could have, right off the bat, taken this 2, plugged it in for that x, had 2 squared was 4, times uh, 4 is 16, plus 3 is 19, and that would have taken us right to the final answer. This direct substitution property is valid for all polynomial and rational functions with non-zero denominators. Try direct substitution first. Uh, third theorem, the limit of a polynomial and rational functions. If p is a polynomial function and c is a real number, then the limit as x approaches that number c of p of x is p of c 
plug that c value in for x. If r is a rational function given by r of x is p of x divided by q of x, and c is a real number such that it's not going to equal 0, then our limit as we approach c of r of x is equal to r of c, which we can break up into that quotient, p of c over q of c. Again, a fancy mathematical way of saying try that direct substitution work uh, first. So here, example 3, find the limit. We have a uh, rational function. Oops. Numerator is a polynomial function, x squared plus x plus 2. Denominator is a different polynomial function, x plus 1. Uh, if we have a negative 1 in the denominator, we will run into trouble, but we're not plugging in a negative 1. So since the uh, denominator is not 0 when x is 1, just apply theorem 1, 3, and we plug that 1 in for x, and let's see what we get. The limit as x approaches 1 of this, I'm just going to call it f of x, is equal to, plug that 1 in for every x. So our numerator is 1 squared plus 1 plus 2 divided by 1 plus 1. And up in the numerator here we get 1 plus 1 is 2, uh, 2 more is 4, and we divide that by denominator, 1 plus 1 is 2, 4 divided by 2 is 2. Our limit is 2. Again, it is set up as a quotient. Direct substitution should always be your first attempt. Polynomial functions and rational functions are two of the three basic types of algebraic functions. The following the theorem deals with the limit of a third type of algebraic function one that involves a radical. Uh, Appendix A does have a proof of this theorem. And the theorem just says let n be a positive integer, so that's our index out here outside the, uh, the radical sign. The following limit is valid for all c if the index there is odd. And it's valid for uh, c's that are positive greater than 0 if n is even. So our limit as x approaches c, again we just plug that uh, c in place of the x, and it becomes the nth root of c. And remember the even odd thing, if we're taking the square root of something or the fourth root of something, we can only take even roots of things that are positive. If we have odd roots, like the third root or the fifth root, we can take that of a negative value. Negatives can escape from underneath odd indices, if you remember that from pre-calc. So the following theorem greatly expands your ability uh, to evaluate limits because it shows how to analyze the limit of a composite function. Again, theorem uh, appendix A does have a proof of this. So we have two functions, the f function and the g functions. Uh, the limit of the g function is L, and the limit of the f function is uh, equal to f, or the limit as x approaches L of f of x is f of L. So here's our limit, the limit as x approaches C of our composite f of g of x. And this g of x is the limit as x approaches c of g of x, and then we run that through the f function. So it's going to be the f of the limit l. Just another way of saying try direct substitution first. So here we have a limit of a composite function. Uh, because the limit as x approaches 0 of this piece, x squared plus 4 is 0 squared plus 4, or just 4, and we have the limit as x approaches 4, you know this 4 now becomes our arrow number, so to speak, down here of this other limit. The limit as x approaches 4 of the square root function of x is the square root of 4, or 2. It follows that. Here's where we got to set that up as a composite function. Oops, I should have left myself a little more room here. So it follows that the limit as x approaches 0, what I'm going to do is take this function and I'm going to plug it in where I see this x under the radical. So it's going to be our composite function, running one function through another. So this is not just going to be the square root of x, I'm plugging this function in for x. x squared plus 4. And what's that going to equal? That should equal 2. Again, we can just do direct substitution. Now, this is just a composite function. We plug in our 0. 0 squared is 0, plus 4 is just 4. The square root of 4 is equal to 2. Even if it's a composite function, try direct substitution.
And here in part B is just another example of that. Here we're our first limit, we're approaching 3 of this function. And if we plug that 3 in, we get 2 times 3 to, uh, squared minus 10, and that's equal to 8. And then we have a different function. You know, this 8 now comes down here. The limit as we approach 8 of the cube function, the third root of x, becomes the third root of 8 or 2. So because these are true, it follows that. We can make a composite. The limit as x approaches 3, that's where we started here. And now we create our composite function. Now we're going to have the third root of this function, 2x squared minus 10. What is that equal to? We can just do direct substitution. You plug that in there. Underneath the radical, you'll get the 8, just like we did here. And then the third root of 8 is equal to 2. And now the final theorem here uh, for the direct substitution stuff, theorem 1, 6. Uh, we've got to talk about the trig functions. Let's see be a real number in the domain of the given trig function. Uh, the limit as x approaches c of sine x is sine c. We just plug that c in place for x. Same for cosine. The limit as x approaches c of cos x is cos c. And that's exactly the same for the other four trig functions. Just try that direct substitution first. So here in example 5, we have a uh, part a. The limit as x approaches 0 of tan x. So that becomes, what is the tan of 0? If we remember our pre-calc, uh, the tangent graph goes through the origin. It goes up to the right, down to the left, from a half pi to negative half pi. So what's the tangent of 0? It's right at the origin, so that's equal to 0. Direct substitution did work. Now let's see, here we have uh, the limit as x approaches pi of x times cos x. So we plug pi in for the x's, and we have pi times the cosine of pi. And let's see here, what is the cosine of pi? Back to the unit circle. Pi radians is over here. And cosine is our x value. So the cos of pi is negative 1. This becomes pi times negative 1, or negative pi. And let's see here, we have the limit as x approaches 0 of sine squared of x. Remember, we can write sine squared of x as sine of x quantity squared and we're looking at the limit as x approaches 0. So what if we, or excuse me, we just plug that 0 in there, the sine of 0, quantity squared. And for the sine of 0, now we're on this side of the unit circle, that would be 1 comma 0. Sine is our y coordinate, so that sine of 0 is 0, and 0 squared is 0. Okay, uh, a little calculator exercise. Uh, use a graphing utility to graph the function and visually estimate the limits. Uh, plug this calculator into your TI-89 and make sure you parenthesize off that whole numerator. You will need parentheses for containing what is under the radical sign divided by parenthesize off that denominator also. Make sure when you hit enter that the function looks just like this in your display. And then the directions are asking you to visually estimate the limits. So you could use the trace feature. You know, get your x moving along the curve and see what happens right around the x value of 4. Come up with an estimate of that height. And the same thing for x approaching 0. And we went through, again, those first uh, six theorems are all about direct substitution. What you should get from those first six theorems and what this whole video is about, always try direct substitution first when you're evaluating a limit. And that's probably a good spot to end this first video for section 2-3.